All right, we're going to go ahead and get started with the uh, next panel, the one that everybody's been waiting for, to discuss funding of uh, all this uh, new, new equipment and automation to make this all work for us. Um, I know uh, Bill Ayer talked about uh, passion and buy-in and ownership, and I think we're all pretty clear that we all have that, but the question is, do we have the right funding mechanism in place? After the last few years of uh, over 20 short-term extensions of FAA reauthorization, the two-week partial shutdown in 2011, um, sequestration that we're currently under, uh, controller furloughs, uh, luckily those ended, delayed these, the sequestration which delayed many, if not all, of the uh, next-gen programs that we're here talking about, uh, and proposed uh, tower closures. And all of that is to the detriment of any progress that uh, we want to see out of these programs. Um, so I want to go through and, and have everybody introduce themselves, do a couple of short, or just a short opening remark, three to five minutes, and then uh, I have a question to start it off, and then we'll open it up to Q&A, uh, similar to the last panel that I moderated. So I think there's going to be a lot of questions and, and discussions around this topic. So I'll, to my left is uh, Captain Lee Moak, President of uh, Airline Pilots Association International. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I am the president of the Airline Pilots Association. NextGen is very important to our members. As you've heard today, and many of you already know, and I think Bill did a great job in his remarks, NextGen is a complex uh, system. It requires a lot of detail, and it is expensive. However, it's necessary, and doing part of it is not an option. So part of the overall planning and programming has to be a commitment for sustained and adequate funding. Funding that is free of, free and independent of Washington political gamesmanship. We just experienced a situation due to sequestration. Our air transportation system was in a large part held hostage by these partisan politics. We have to recognize that some of the early benefits of NextGen are not to our airlines, but to the FAA and to the federal government. Nevertheless, the airlines need to equip if we're going to realize the potential safety and efficiency benefits of NextGen. The NextGen initiatives and fundings of the air traffic system in the United States rely on, in part, government funding from taxpayer dollars. The balance comes from a patchwork of taxes and fees from the airlines. Right now, Airlines pay the majority of the cost for operating the national airspace system. And reducing the tax burden on our employers, I believe, would help our industry. All users will reap the benefits, and all should bear a fair share of the cost. The airlines cannot operate, they cannot afford to pay the cost of this operation and maintaining our current system, along with the additional expense to purchase avionics equipment that may not realize its full benefit for many years. So we need to plan to pay for both operating the existing ATC system and modernizing the NAS without driving our airlines out of the business. As such, ALPA opposes any new commercial aviation user taxes, which are often disguised as fees and calls on Congress to level the playing field as it relates to airline taxes. Obviously, one way to make a positive business case is to show a return on the investment for airlines that take that step to put the technology on their aircraft, develop the procedures, and train the crews to take advantage of NextGen, the concepts with that, and the capabilities that are already available. That's why we're here today to explore ways that we can get more action and definable results from all the strategic planning that's gone on before. We have to find ways to reward airlines who are the leaders in NextGen. If they're going to invest in technology, they have to see a benefit. We can't keep sending airplanes to the boneyard with advanced technology that's never been used. We need commitment from the government. And that commitment should be part of a national aviation policy, a national airline policy, a policy to level the playing field for our airlines. That national aviation policy must start with a complete review and overhaul of the aviation taxes and fees paid by the airlines. In addition, 
This policy must include recommendations on how we fund and structure our air traffic system in order to create some sort of independence and isolate it from the politics of Washington while also giving the users a strong voice in the key decisions needed in order to modernize the system. Remember, we're here today to talk about perspectives on next gen. As a pilot, I'm tired of seeing equipment in my airplane that I can't use, either because the supporting infrastructure isn't there, or because the procedures haven't been developed, or the training hasn't happened. It's time to have the conversation about how to do best equipped, best served, into a way to show benefits for early adopters without damaging the industry overall. We don't have all the answers, but if we, do, if we don't have this conversation, don't have these summits, these forums, where we can put everything on the table and talk about it, we'll never move closer to solutions. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Lee. And uh, next to uh, Lee's left is uh, Paul Rinaldi, president of the uh, National Air Traffic Controllers Association. Thanks, Steve. Um, <laughs> funding of the national airspace system. And, and those might think that um, my organization has pivoted uh, to open up the discussion and see exactly uh, what is the best way to fund this system. And we actually have. There's a game changer out there, and it's called the sequester. When you could see uh, the FAA closing 149 air traffic control towers, not because of safety, but because to save money, to tell 10% of the air traffic controllers to go home, not because of safety, but because to save money. You look at a restriction in the national airspace system, you look at uh, delays for no apparent reason, you look at the funding system that is generating this economic engine, you go, we should have this discussion. I don't have the answers. As Lee said, we don't have all the answers. We don't have any of the answers. But I do know that the current system is broken. And this conversation needs to start to happen. I know they're happening in closed doors, behind closed doors. I know people are talking about it. How do we get to this point? But we should bring this discussion to the forefront, have it as adults with the passion of a growing, thriving aviation system, making sure that we can accommodate all users from the, the, the single engine Cessna pilot to the 777 flying across the pond, and making sure that we're not strangling the airlines, especially the airlines of this country, because the competition, I think when we talked about next gen, we talked about, well, in, in 10 years or 15 years, we're gonna see you know, a, a growing uh, airline community. And unfortunately, I don't think we're gonna actually see that growing airline community from within the United States. I think the competition is coming from overseas, and we could start to actually see that going on there. If we do not mature, have this discussion, find a way to you know, sustainably fund this system properly so that we can modernize it, we are going to fall way behind the world. Uh, Senator Rockefeller often jokes that we're, you know, we're, we're just behind Mongolia in air traffic control system. I, I'm fearful that if we don't address this, that that actually might become an accurate statement as you look at you know, NAV Canada and you look at the technology that they're investing and you go, they might be able to actually run the oceans more efficient than the United States. And would they actually take the oceans over? And then what kind of negative impact will that have on United States Airlines? And what kind of negative impact would it have on if they took the Caribbean and then took the Gulf? And then said, oh, by the way, we could actually do Florida also because we have the Caribbean and the Gulf and start piecemealing our system out. Now is the time for us to have this discussion. Now is the time for us to invest in our future. We all love aviation. We all have a passion for aviation. And everybody in this room should have ownership to have this discussion and see exactly which is the best way to fund this system so it grows, so it thrives, so it continues to be the economic engine in this country, the job creator it is, Every single one of us owe it to the aviation system because we all make our living here. And we all have that passion about aviation. And that's all this is right now. It's not, oh, NAC is signing up for privatization. Oh, NAC is signing up for this. We're signing up for the discussion. Not behind closed doors, but in the forefront. How do we fund this system properly? Randy Babbitt uh, had, had this great analogy, and, and I use it a lot. 
Uh, Randy has the ultimate perspective of aviation, uh, from, being, uh, from sitting in your chair to being the administrator to actually being a private consultant to now being a VP uh, at Southwest, Southwest Airlines. And he said the current funding system for capital projects is if NextGen was a shed, in 2010, we say we're going to build NextGen and it's this shed. 2011, Congress would appropriate some two by fours to build this, this shed and they would sit there. And in 2012, Congress would appropriate some two by sixes for this next gen project. And in 2013, there'll be some nails and we could actually start to look at what framing is. And in 2014, there would be some, some plywood that we'd put up some walls. And in 2015, a brand new Congress would come in and say, that is an old piece of crap and we're not putting any more money to it. <laughs> and that's the reality that we have today. When you, you, we just listened to Bill talking about, you know, this is the technology we're trying to do today has been around since 1995. And technology is forever changing. So we have to, we have to find a, a sustainable way to move forward, a, a funding system that we can uh, invest in the infrastructure, a funding system that we can have an aviation system grow, and we can all prosper, and we can continue to be the world leader. And that's what we're signing up for for the, the conversation. Thanks, Paul. Uh, next to Paul is uh, Robert Poole, uh, Searle Freedom Trust Transportation Fellow and Director of Transportation Policy at the uh, Reason Foundation. Thanks very much, uh, Steve. And I couldn't ask for a better setup for what I'm going to say than what Paul has just said, because there is a really a growing consensus that the funding system is broken. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I've heard that from over the last uh, six months in particular. One of the things that really shocked me that's been gotten almost no discussion is that when OMB made the rules for how the sequester would apply to FAA, AIP was exempt, but facilities and equipment was not. I mean, when the Aviation Trust Fund was created, it was to safeguard the money that aviation user taxes put in to be for infrastructure for aviation, which meant the air traffic control system and the airports. Well, that's clearly gone by the boards somehow. Uh, a lot of other people that are really experts on the federal budget look at the FAA budget in a, in a time of shrinking federal resources and look, what's the most likely outcome? Well, there's only a few accounts. Congress loves AIP. Operations, you've got to keep the people employed and doing their jobs. The fall guy is always going to be facilities and equipment. It gets the short end of the stick. It's the easiest thing to cut. Short term, it's not that big. Long term, of course, it's a disaster. But Congress, politicians live for the short term, not for the long term. We have to live in a world of the real world of long term. The problem, uh, it's been mentioned that we've had the idea that the, the, these, this rag bag of, of taxes is a reliable funding source, I mean, is really falsified by history. We've had suspension of those aviation taxes in 1981, 82, 95, and 2011, when it was even worse, when we had a partial shutdown of the FAA in 2011. Also, for the taxing ticket prices and fuel, those are both the re uh, resources that are not really growing. Uh, airlines, to, to the great credit of creative business people, are figuring out how to put less and less into the ticket price, which is what's taxed. Uh, so that's not growing in pace with the actual flights. Uh, likewise, all the uh, impetus in aircraft design and operational procedures is toward lower fuel consumption. So if you tax fuel, you're going to get less and less in proportion to the, how the system grows. So that's broken. Uh, basically, there's also something, if you ask economists, who understand long-lived infrastructure, how should you pay for that? The idea that you pay for a $20 billion infrastructure project out of annual operating cash flow is nuts. You wouldn't run any business that way. You wouldn't certainly run an electric utility that way. Uh, almost all other major infrastructure, airports, electricity, pipelines, railroads, they fund major capital uh, expenditures mostly out of bonding. They finance this, just like you finance when you buy your house. But to do that, you have to have a reliable revenue stream, one that you can count on year after year, not something that's at the political whim of Congress to decide whether it's there and how much it's going to be. Now, there's a few other concerns that, that set the stage for suggesting that we really need to rethink the whole, whole system. We know that. Uh, I've been reading GAO reports about FAA procurement for about 25 years. 
And you read them once from 25 years ago uh, about the NAS plan and various things, all the same things that are being said today in GAO and Inspector General reports about uh, the terrible procurement capabilities of FAA. I mean, this is not, it's not only FAA's fault. This is a lot of fault because of micromanagement by Congress and funding and so forth. But that's, that's broken also. Um, as wonderful as the NAC is, and I really think it's been a tremendous step forward of everybody getting together and working on priorities, the NAC is only advisory. Um, you should have that kind of consensus, actually making the decisions about what the user community is, what, where is the business cases, what is the user stakeholder community willing to support and work together to bring about. But an advisory only, while it's a step in the right direction, doesn't really get you where you need to go. And Congress continues to insert, for good or for ill, its own priorities every time they legislate. They set their own deadlines for things that should be done. Maybe they make sense, but a lot of times they don't. Um, Congress acts as if it's the board of directors for this system, when uh, what we're seeing around the world is different kinds of boards of directors. And so my, my message today, uh, not a new message, but I think it's, it's more timely than ever, is that we need funding reform and, and the big governance reform, how decisions get made about what uh, this air traffic control system does, what priority, what things to do when. Uh, the Management Advisory Council of the FAA, on which, on which Paul sits, in March of this year sent a letter to the uh, senior uh, members of Congress dealing with aviation saying that the funding system is broken and really needs to be replaced and recommended things like a, a, a dependable 10-year funding plan, a new sustainable revenue source, and they sort of hinted at maybe one that would be bondable, and a governing, a governing board, governing board, mind you, of aviation stakeholders that would make policy and, and set priority. And I think that, that is a huge step in the right direction. But other countries have gone further. Uh, they've, the pattern over the last 25 years in country after country has been to separate the air traffic provider from the safety regulator, because those are two very, very different jobs, and enable the air traffic provider to be self-supporting from revenues that are paid by the customers by the people that fly planes directly to the provider, which gives the bondable revenue stream that allows for issuing revenue bonds that can finance major capital expenditures. And believe it or not, uh, many, of, certainly the larger uh, air navigation providers like NAV Canada, like NATS, like DFS, have investment grade bond ratings. I mean, the, the financial market says, yeah, this is a sustainable kind of a thing. This is a good investment. These, these are likely uh, assuming that the projects they invest the money in make sense and actually have a business case, these are going to be sound investments and we recommend that people buy those bonds. Over 50 countries have made this transition in the last 25 years. And we now have studies, three or four major studies looking at the performance and they're all performing well. And almost all of the measurable parameters are better after the transition than before the transition. And ICAO itself has policies saying this is a good idea, in fact, that there should be organizational separation between safety regulation and air traffic service provision. So there's a case out there, and this has been recommended many times. Air Transport Association in 1986 made the first significant serious study proposal for this kind of a, of a change. The Clinton-Gore administration proposed the U.S. Air Traffic Services Corporation, and Norm Mineta introduced the enabling legislation in 1994. NATCA, in fact, endorsed that, uh, that, that transformation, didn't gain traction, partly because the aviation community, I think, unlike today, was completely at odds with one another and divided and was not able to coalesce around it and tell, tell Congress, you've got to do this because the status quo isn't, isn't working. It's working much less than it is today. So that's, that's basically the message. I think that's the conversation that we really, really do need to have. And uh, it's time to get busy working on a US version of, of what's becoming the state of the practice around the world. Thank you, Bob. Next to uh, Bob is uh, Nick Calio, the uh, president and CEO for uh, Airlines for America. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm at the happy point where almost everything's been said. Uh, so notes are meaningless. So I would like to start, though, by thanking 
uh, both ALPA and NATCA for number one, holding this conference, uh, number two, for inviting our participation, and number three, in light of all the talk today about collaboration and partnership, uh, the partnership and collaboration that we've had in recent years. It's been terrific. Uh, when we go in places together to see legislators or policymakers and speak with one mind about the state of the industry and what needs to be done for the industry because we all do well together or all do not so well together, uh, it means something. So thank you both. Um, I'm going to make just a couple points about next gen in the near term. Airlines are willing to support next gen infrastructure if we can show economic or operational benefits. That hasn't always been the case so far. More often than not, it hasn't. Lee talked about you know, airplanes going to the boneyards with a lot of aviation or avionics on it uh, that were never able to be used. And that has to be fixed or there's really no business case for airlines which are in business to invest any more than they already have. Uh, to realize the next gen dream, the FAA's got to show some short-term benefits to the stakeholders and ensure that they can gain confidence in the FAA's ability to deliver the goods, if you will. Uh, if that doesn't happen, uh, you're not going to see the desire to go further than we are. We have equipment on the airplanes now that could be used as not being used. If we could do that in the short term, uh, I think the long term would look much more promising. And that gets to the point that Lee was making about the need for a national airline policy, the state of the industry, and the overly burdensome tax and regulation and fees on the industry. We can't bear much more. And as a key stakeholder, that's got to be looked at in context. So you've got to find a way to pay for it, and then I'll get the funding in a second. Um, I would say that getting it done is not so much a function right now of how much money you put it, throw at it. It's a function of good stakeholder teamwork. And I have thought for some time in my brief time relatively in the industry, um, strong center leadership that can make binding decisions when things bog down. You know, my experience in government suggests to me, and there may be cases where people think we've had this, I don't see it myself. You need somebody in charge of next gen who has the authority to kick down doors and when somebody says no, we can't do that or no, we're not going to do that, to make them accountable for it. That I think would push things along. You only need a few good examples before people start to sit up a little bit. And as Bill Ayer was talking about, um, lights that were supposedly green uh, that went to red might turn green. So I think that is something we need to look at. If you could show these short-term benefits, it's, it's the low-hanging fruit. Um, we could do some things in the next few years that would gain the confidence or instill the confidence that I've been talking about. It really should not be that difficult. Uh, the difficulty will come later with very expensive new next-gen programs. But again, if you've shown an economic benefit and you can continue to show an economic benefit to make the business case, airlines will buy into that. You know, we're in business. If you can show, if you can, if you can do well for your customers, if you can do well for the environment, if you can do that, it makes all the sense in the world to do it. If you can, it's a very different story. Now, in that regard, in terms of funding, we do have a problem. You know, people say the FAA should run this like a business, and they should. Uh, to run something like a business, one of the things you need is a steady funding stream. You can't have the stop, start, stop, start. You also need, and this all deals with where I'm going to in sequestration, you need the flexibility to deal with points where business is low, where you do have funding cuts. This notion of the anomalies, budget anomalies like the AIP, and all, uh, the whole laundry list, and this has nothing to do with AIP, but there's this whole area of the budget that's been hived off and isn't subject to sequestration, meaning that the FAA is absorbing a disproportionate share of the funding cuts. And we believe, A4A believes, as I know that ALPA does, uh, that the FAA has the authority or the discretion to move money around. If they don't, we need to find it in the short term. In the long term, we need to find a different funding mechanism. And I do think the private markets are a way to look. You know, my reputation, I think, over the long haul has been that I'm pretty straightforward. I think that uh, Lee and Paul take that to the next level, which is great to get this out on the table. It is a discussion we need to have. If the current system is broken, you just don't keep it and stick with it particularly in light of everything that we all know is coming that's been talked about here earlier today. 
there's going to be an increase in travel. There's going to be more planes. You know, we've got greater foreign competition, which plays into it. We need the best system in the world. We need to be the leader in the world in aviation. Part of that is we've been fighting for is the national aviation policy. A key part, portion of that or pillar of that is the best air traffic control system. So thank you. Thanks, Nick. And next to uh, Nick is uh, Roger Cohen, president of the uh, Regional Airline Association. Uh, thanks a lot. <clears throat> I really want to thank again Alpha and NATCA for inviting us. Uh, and real special thanks to our friends at Alpha for your strong support of our recent uh, convention in, uh, in Montreal. And hope all of you join us next year in, in St. Louis. One of the things we did in Montreal is we raised a record amount of money for our scholarship program for young aviation students. and. Uh, Lee personally uh, was the number one contributor to that fund. And I'm going to share a little secret with you right now that uh, whatever story he told you about how he got that brace on his leg, he really got it tripping over everybody to be the last guy in in the silent auction. So, uh, um, but thank you, Lee. Really, it was, it was, it was great. Um, uh, as Scott, um, my colleague, opened up this morning, it's real important to have the regional perspective in this. We operate 50% of the flights in the country. Uh, but more importantly, there's 500 US communities in this country. That's 3 quarters of all the cities with any service have service exclusively from regional airlines. Um, uh, and to these communities, that, that service is just as important, if not more important, than an internet connection. And that's why. We've got to continue to make air service as much a national priority as broadband or anything else. Um, <clears throat> I'm not a pilot, um, but I do kind of share, I think, a, a unique personal perspective because I've actually had a 50-yard line seat and been a kibitzer on the sidelines on this debate about funding of ATC since I got here in 1988. Uh, and I saw the Wendell Ford bill that led to the Belisles Commission which said that FAA could safely sp uh, split the duties from operating the system. The Gore Commission, uh, where it said that the users of the system should fund its development and operation, but I stress here, uh, should not cause any undue economic disruption on any one sector. The whole, um, during the Bush administration, the rekindling of the, the debate on privatizing the system. And I'm gonna share another uh, story. Uh, in typical DC hired gun fashion, so I spent 15 years at ATA trying to cook up reasons why privatizing the system was a good idea, and I spent two years at the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association rabble-rousing why it was the end of Western civilization. So um, I, I do have kind of, I, I guess I, I have worn both hats on this one. Uh, <laughs> hold on that thought. <laughs> um, I, I think it's important though to fast forward to today uh, as it relates to the regional industry. Uh, because when these debates de began, here's where we are today. We went from carrying about 40 million passengers a year to 160, that's a 400% increase. Uh, our RPMs have increased 1,000% in that period. Um, as Scott pointed out today, regionals comprise more than half the flights at the most crowded airports, and that's Philadelphia, and National, LaGuardia, Minneapolis, St. Paul. We're more than 60% at O'Hare and Houston and Dulles and Detroit, and even those places that you don't associate with regional airlines, LAX and San Francisco, for example, crowded airspace, were more than a third of the flights. Um, and here's the most important point, though, where I think we've come a long way, is that our regional leaders, our CEOs of our airlines, are really now and have been deeply engaged in this whole issue. Um, Brian Bedford of Republic Airlines was on the, the La Hood Fact Commission. Uh, uh, Chip Childs, the CEO of uh, SkyWest, uh, and uh, Phil Trenary before him, a former Pinnacle CEO, were on the MAC. Jim Rankin of Air Wisconsin, a, a very uh, active member of the NAC. Um, all of them are pilots, which also sets them apart, I think, from a lot of other CEOs. All of them licensed pilots. But the most passionate about the benefits of NextGen is uh, Dan Wolf, who is a full-time Massachusetts state senator, president of Cape Air, and they fly the smallest airplanes, piston airplanes, nine-seaters. And he is the most passionate in talking about the benefits of NextGen. And as everybody in this room recognizes, and as everybody has talked about today, 
um, the lessons we've learned from sequestration, um, I think we really have reached the tipping point. Uh, uh, that we can no longer count on the U.S. government uh, to provide a reliable and predicted, predictable funding stream for this absolutely critical infrastructure project, which is funding the uh, air traffic control system. So in saying that, that it, that's a, let me just put up a real small yellow light. That's not a red light, but a yellow light. Um, the current business model that is in the commercial aviation industry um, doesn't lend itself right now to a one-size-fits-all funding stream. And this is a lesson that Canada has successfully looked at, had to overcome, and is fixed, and that in order to preserve the service um, to all of those communities, that this funding pie gets split so that it doesn't disadvantage smaller aircraft that absolutely need to serve these smaller communities. So as long as that is out there, I do believe that the debate has changed quite a bit and, uh, um, and uh, look forward to, to sharing more about it. Thanks. Thanks, Roger. And uh, on the far left, last but not least, uh, Ed Boland, President and CEO of National Business Aviation Association. Well, thanks, and I'll just uh, repeat my thanks to Lee and Paul for convening this and giving us an opportunity to talk about the importance of next gen and moving forward and keeping the U.S. air transportation system uh, the best in the world. Uh, I have the opportunity, the privilege and pleasure of representing the business aviation community, which is a very important part of our air transportation system and a very important part of our nation's economy. Uh, we're 1.2 million jobs, uh, a lot of important manufacturing jobs in the United States. We're an industry that contributes positively to our nation's balance of trade. Uh, and we're an economic lifeline to a lot of communities uh, around the United States with little or no commercial airline service. Uh, NBAA's got roughly 10,000 members. 85% uh, of those members are small and mid-sized companies, um, typically using their airplane to do things they can't accomplish with other modes of transportation. Um, having said that, they are uh, some of the biggest purchasers of commercial airline tickets in the United States. Uh, the business aviation community for a number of years has been very, very enthusiastic and involved in trying to move toward next gen. Uh, a lot of that is for parochial reasons. Uh, what we have seen over the years is when airports and airspace gets very crowded, we tend to get pushed out to secondary and tertiary airports. Uh, a lot of you probably remember, you know, when Midway was a great general aviation airport, uh, or Florida Executive was a great general aviation airport, uh, Mineta up in San Jose. What we see is that when things get congested, we get pushed out. So NBAA, and I think the whole general aviation community, has been very supportive of trying to find ways that we can increase our system's throughput enhance the capacity of our system to make sure we have access to airports and to airspace. Um, we've been very supportive because of the, eco the environmental benefits of NextGen. Uh, and we've been very supportive of NextGen because of what we see as the safety benefits, the better situational awareness that allows us to enhance safety. And so NBAA and really the rest of the general aviation community has been very involved in all of the efforts uh, to move forward on uh, next gen. In fact, I had the opportunity to sit on the future of the U.S. Aerospace Commission uh, back uh, 10, 10 or 12 years ago when next gen was being proposed as a national imperative. So uh, this is something we've been excited about for a long time, and I'm enthusiastic about some of the progress that we are now beginning to see. And I agree with Bill, whose uh, comments this afternoon at, uh, at the lunch suggested we've made a lot of progress. It may not be as fast as we wanted, uh, but we're beginning to see tangible evidence that we're moving forward. We may be moving toward that tipping point. And I think it's accurate to say that what happens over the next 12, 18, 24 months is pretty important on whether we get across the goal line or we go backwards. Uh, these are, by any standard, really tough, challenging, difficult times in Washington, D.C. Uh, a lot of people, and I go around the country all the time, uh, there's kind of a belief that uh, Washington's broken. 
um, need to blow it up, need to go do something else. Uh, this is just a, a, a terrible way to try to run a country. Uh, and that's understandable in a lot of ways. But, you know, it, it, it's been said that democracy is the worst form of government except for all others. And I think as we begin to look forward to what we have and what the alternatives are, we ought to keep in mind that while we may have a lot of warts and a lot of problems that need to be addressed, simply chucking a system and moving to something else may not necessarily be the answer. I think it's important to have the debate. I think it's important to know where we are, what the options are for moving forward. But I think there's a lot that we need to be careful of as we're having this debate. We need to understand that today the U.S. runs the largest, the most sophisticated, the most diverse, and the safest air transportation system in the world. It's the most efficient system in the world. It's the largest system in the world. And we need to be careful on steps we take as we try to move it forward. The United States, as you know, uh, has been a world leader in all aspects of aviation. And past performance, as my broker has always told me, is no indication of the future. I'm hoping that'll be true at some point during this recession. But we, we need to make sure that the U.S. is the world leader. Right? leader. I think uh, Nick was, was right on point on saying that. We need to think through how we move forward. Canada, for example, has 10% of the U.S. population. It's got an economy that's about 10% of the U.S. Uh, it's got an air transportation that's about one-fifth, or excuse me, uh, about 5% of the U.S. Uh, so on a per capita basis, on a per economy basis, it's not what the U.S. is. And I think that's repeated in other parts of the world. As, as this debate has gone on through the years, a couple of things that uh, I've noticed uh, have proven to be very present. Uh, our system does have problems that need to be addressed, and some of those were articulated a long time ago in this debate. Some of those have not improved. Some of those have gotten worse. But some of the things haven't quite played out the way people expected. Uh, there was a lot of talk when this idea of privatization was first mentioned uh, back in the 80s and 90s, and the idea on it was we need a stable and predictable funding system. The system that we have today is just not reliable. But the reality is, if you go back and look at funding for the FAA over the last 15 years, what you will see is an almost unbroken line of increases. Increases despite the fact that we had a tech bubble burst. Increases despite the fact that we had terrorist attacks. We stood up the Department of Homeland Security. We fought two wars. We had Katrina. Every year, I'm told, there's a new reason why funding for the FAA is going to go away, and a primary part of that funding going away is going to be the general fund contribution. I remember hearing seven or eight years ago that the general fund contribution is at 20 percent. It's going down to 16, then it's going to 11, and then it's going away. So don't have any idea that the general fund's going to be around, and if you suggest it is, you're naive. Today, the general fund contribution is over $4 billion. It's over 25% of the funding. I think before we give up on the system, we ought to say, look, where's that $4 billion going to come from? Is that going to be new taxes on the industry? Is it going to be significant cuts and closures? How exactly is this going to work? It doesn't mean it can't, but it's a pretty big hole to start with when you say what we need is really more funding. We need more revenues to move forward. It seems a tough way to start by going and saying, let's get rid of the first $4 billion in, into the coffers. Now, I, I know it comes with strings attached. I know Congress isn't always easy to deal with. But I think we need to think through what happens to that general fund contribution. This year, the general fund contribution in fiscal year 13 was $4.6 billion. Sequestration was $600 million. That takes us down to $4, million, $4 billion. That's still a big hole. The proposed budget for fiscal year 14 has got the general fund contribution going down to $3.2 billion. That's going to be the government's request, although we have seen through the years that Congress generally gives more in general fund contribution than the industry asked for. 
$3.2 billion is a lot of years of sequestration cuts before you say, okay, now we're even. And let me be clear, sequestration does not look very palatable from the general aviation community. 148 towers closing, 10% furloughs. This is not pleasant. In the first taste, I think we were all pretty repelled. And I think when we begin fiscal year 14, someone's going to say, you didn't like that taste, but here's a second helping. These are not easy times. I'm not suggesting there are no problems. Don't worry, be happy. We got a lot of work to do. All I'm suggesting is, Today, the U.S. has the world's best air transportation system, largely thanks to a lot of people in the room today. We have a Congress that, while it drives us crazy, has provided pretty stable funding. Every member that I represent has had their funding go like this through economic downturns. The FAA's funding has stayed stable or gone up. I think we need to be careful that we look before we jump that we have discussions like this and we make sure that collectively we all do what we know we need to do, which is take the steps necessary to keep the U.S. the world leader. Thanks, Ed. I think uh, I, I have just a question. I think we need to keep in mind that our goal is, all of our goal is to maintain the safest, most efficient aviation industry in the world. And with that in mind, and given the budget turmoil that we have, even though it's steady and even growing, the starts and stops and the three-month uh, uh, extensions and wondering what's going to happen in all those increments, it does have an effect. And if you were keen for a day and you could make changes, whether it stay the same, whether it's completely privatized, whether it's some form of government corporation, whether it's just reforming the tax code, what would you do and we'll start with Lee. Oh, great. Oh. <laughs> I like the whole notion of being king for the day. But uh, I just want to piggyback on something said down here, and then uh, it'll help answer the question. Look, um, uh, unlike my colleagues, I'm new to Washington still, a uh, few years. And the thing that I found in Washington, uh, there are a lot of cynics here. Uh, not my colleagues, but the cynics here are the ones that they start out every sentence by, <laughs> OK. We'll have a conversation, but let's, let's agree to do no harm first, because they've seen that happen so often. And if you look at what we're trying to do here, is we have to do something, and the time to do something is right now, because if we don't do something, we're watching proposals coming out of the administration that are not palatable. Whether it's a $100 per segment tax, for debt relief, when we have infrastructure, infrastructure holes that we need to fill, we as a group, the users, we need to be having this discussion. So I, I don't think I'd get an argument now to answer this question, that if we could just have a conversation on tax and fee reform, I don't think I'd get much of an argument that the current system with 17 different unique taxes and fees if you were creating the system with this group of people, that's not the system we would have, okay? And what's going on now, the reason why, I believe, one of the primary reasons that small communities are losing surf service is because of unsustainable taxes and fees and gas, okay? Small community service is important. We need to be mindful of that. Great point made by 50% of the takeoffs and landings come out of the RAA. Another point is that's just a small part of the available seat miles that reside over here with uh, Airlines for America. So if you take a look at the uh, uh, business aircraft and general aviation, what they provide to the, to the US, one of these uh, taxes would have, this $100 tax would be an incredible, uh, cause incredible damage to them, okay? But then there would be others that would say that, well, you know, it's not so big, it can always get worse. The bottom line is, it's time to have a discussion. What we would all like would be a fair and equitable system. Take a look at that and not be distracted by, and I understand there's probably another discussion on privatization, but not be dis distracted by privatization. Let's first figure out how to properly fund the system, something that makes sense, and something that can't be unilaterally hijacked by having the immigration fee doubled or the agricultural fee doubled. It's not a tax, we're just doubling it because you know we got to check those plants a little better. Or the security fee because you know you can't argue with security 
Can't argue with that. Let's double or triple that security fee. But those are taxes that are not clearly passed on to the consumer. And again, just to throw the cards face up on the table, if you try to, if you try to point that out, there is an agency that is quick to say, hey, we don't want you, to, we don't want you putting those taxes like that on your websites. <laughs> We'd prefer you don't talk about that. You know, so the bottom line is I'd say, hey, uh, with the people uh, that are in the system and know what we need to go forward, without all the ancillary issues coming into it, let's have a good discussion on what would be the tax structure and how that tax structure could be modified going forward. And uh, that would be king of the day. I'd do that. King of the day. I'm not sure I'd <laughs> focus on aviation issues, but let's just. Uh, <laughs> is that the genie? We're just model? saying. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, so we're just, yeah. uh, all right. Now uh, but if I only had to be king of the day and focus on aviation issues, and being the only somewhat FAA insider in here, I would find a way uh, to make, and it, uh, Randy Babbitt used to use this, uh, this term, find a way to make the FAA a high-functioning bureaucracy uh, and streamline the lines of business and open the uh, collaboration across lines of business within the FAA so that not everybody is care, cares about their little turf of what they're supposed to be doing on their desk, but actually cares about the big picture of safely and efficiently moving airplanes from point A to point B, uh, and advancing technology. And that goes from, it's, it's just a giant bureaucracy, and, and please don't take this as bashing uh, current FAA leadership. I think that they have done an outstanding job and will continue to do an outstanding job uh, of a, a massive bureaucracy in which they inherited. And it's, it, it's really hard to, to streamline it. Randy Babbitt really tried, David Grizzle has tried tremendously, and so, as Michael Werta, and I'm sure they're going to continue to try to streamline the bureaucracy. But if I was king for the day and I had to focus on aviation issues, it would certainly be somehow to make the FAA a high-functioning bureaucracy, which in turn might actually fix the funding mechanism because I know there's a lot of internal waste that you really just can't put a dollar sign on because of the cross-bureaucracy that goes on in there. So. Well. I, my bottom line is that you can come up with the most beautiful, uh, perfect structure of funding that's fair to everybody and doesn't disadvantage everyone. But as long as it's a tax that goes, that's paid to the Treasury and then has to be appropriated annually by members of Congress with all of the constraints on them and all of their various interests, we're going to have a fundamental problem. Um, we, don't do, we don't fund airports that way, other than AIP, which is a very small part of most airports' funding. We don't fund electric utilities that way. We don't fund any other large efforts. We pay, people pay bills directly to the infrastructure provider. And the infrastructure provider then goes about its business. It has some kind of external regulation in the public interest, especially where it has a monopoly. But just, we have a model that's the wrong model. I mean, I think we learn that, we learn from history what works and what doesn't work. And I mean, We've seen in place like Canada, most of the same bureau, large bureaucracy, large for Canada, was there before it became NAV Canada and is still there afterwards. But their incentive structure, their ability to directly serve their customers and, and focus on what makes sense to the customers, what's the business, what, what actually meets a business case, now that's their focus. Before, they got their money from the Canadian Parliament, and they had to respond to them. And that's what FAA has to do, because that's the nature of the beast. So I think until we fix the model, all the talk about you know, the perfect funding system is not going to solve the problem. Uh, it may be better than the hodgepodge we have, but as long as Congress can play political games with it, as long as it has to come in annual appropriations, I think we're, gonna, we're still going to have a problem. I'm not going to speak for you, Roger. Okay. But we both immediately thought the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> if we could be king for a day, the Cleveland Indians would win the World Series, <laughs> exactly. and the Browns would win the Super Bowl. Super Bowl yeah. But since we're settled for one, <laughs> you're easy. Um, but since we are focused on aviation, um, I of course would go big. I would say that I'd have, I would have our government writ large look at the our entire industry and all of our employees and everybody together and say that we need to treat this industry as the strategic asset it is, and because that's all about 
American jobs, the American economy, comfort for our customers that you know you guys are flying around, you guys are directing around, um, and that you know we they're on our airplanes. And it would subsume most of what we talked about. It would certainly be Lee's notion on taxes and fees because it's a ridiculous system that's been put together without any thought whatsoever about the overall impact on customers, demand, and uh, the ability of the industry to continue. It would deal with regulations that don't make any sense, which Lee also mentioned. Uh, it would certainly involve next gen. And however we fixed it, if I were king, it would just happen, right? Because I could will it to happen. That would involve reform at the FAA. It would reform the system, finding the right kind of funding for it. Um, and it would also take a look at foreign competition and what we're doing uh, inside our government that makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Certainly wouldn't be things like putting a pre-clearance facility in Abu Dhabi uh, for a whole variety of reasons because it benefits no American consumer or airline uh, and a whole variety of other things. So um, it would be the creation of a national airline policy that would treat this industry the way it should be treated and the way it's treated by some other countries who are buying up planes like they're popcorn. Uh, not even a king could make, you know, give Cleveland a championship and everything, I'm beginning to believe. Uh, I, I, there's some higher power, but I haven't experienced since I was 12 years old. But um, uh, I, I think most importantly, if I were king, the, the key thing that we haven't really touched on is to keep on, right, knock on wood, the contributions and the efforts of every single person in this entire industry that we are right now in the safest period in aviation history. That, I think, is, if I were king, that would be the one wish that I would just, you know, boy, that would be, I would just decree it forever, you know, and land. Um, on this particular issue, I actually think we, um, we've come su such a long way. And because, like I say, I've been on, I've talked out of both sides of my mouth on this issue. Uh, that the fact that we're all up here, I think that we've, we've said, okay, look, we're going to go out to dinner together. What's the, where are we going to go, and how are we going to divide up the check? I think that there is a growing recognition that that's where we are. Um, and if somebody doesn't come along, well, you know, you're going to miss out on the fun. And hopefully we won't get in when we split up the check. You had the tuna fish, and you had this, and it's not going to be anything like that. Uh, but for the first time ever, I feel very optimistic that this debate has gotten off the dime which is really where it's been stuck, you know, since, you know, almost since I started in this business. Thanks. Ed? Uh, I'm, I might vote for Nick to be king. I thought, uh, <laughs> I thought his uh, you state... You vote for king. <laughs> well, I still, I, st I still might like his platform. Are you saying he's not king? I thought that, I thought that was a given. I, thought, uh, I didn't waste... I, I, you know, I do think... Uh, Helping make aviation a national priority is pretty fundamental, and it's a frustration for all of us because, you know, if there's anything that divided government ought to be able to agree on, it's transportation, transportation infrastructure, because this is what facilitates commerce, employs a lot of people. It makes everything else happen. And when you look at the way aviation does get treated sometimes, it, it is a, it's a huge frustration. Uh, so making it a priority, I think, would be right up there on my list. I do want to do make a couple comments because, you know, Bob's talked uh, about privatization and, and we've, we've got some uh, concerns about privatization that we've articulated over the years, but also uh, some concerns about user fees. Um, and so, as I think all of you know, general aviation, business aviation, contributes through fuel taxes. And fuel taxes are are really good for our industry. That doesn't mean in any way, shape, or form they're good for others. I think some of the mistakes that get made sometimes is people sometimes look at business aviation and say it's just like the commercial airlines, and it's not. And sometimes I think people make mistakes saying it's completely different than the commercial airlines. Well, we've got some similarities too, but when, when we look at paying the fuel tax, it's easy, it's simple, it's fast, and it's efficient. And for companies that are not in aviation to make money on aviation, that's pretty good. It's very similar to when you drive your car and you're filling up the fuel tank. Um, there's been a lot of concerns in our industry uh, about 
you know, the, the, the administrative burden that comes with trying to handle invoices, trying to process them. I think uh, the airlines made a comment up at ICAO in 1993 that said it cost them 85 to $125 to process an invoice. Well, that's a lot of money for an organization that's not in the transportation system. We probably can't process them as efficiently as the airlines can. So that's a concern. Another concern that we've had is the bureaucracy necessary to oversee and do the funding, uh, the billing, the collection, the audits, and so forth of a user fee system. Uh, it seems to us that at least some portion of the money that goes in on a user fee system then has to be used to fund the collection of more fees, whereas this kind of goes directly from the pump into the trust fund and into the system. So uh, I'm not, uh, again, I'm not suggesting that this works for others, but from our experience, we've looked at it and really come to the conclusion that anything a user fee can do for us, the fuel taxes do better. They approximate weight. They approximate distance flown. They create an incentive not to go to congested airports at congested times. They allow people to kind of pick the kind of product uh, they plan to fly, and they, they cost nothing to collect. So we see a lot of value in that as a funding system, uh, and I know that, that there are challenges on trying to figure out how we would do a fuel tax and still use it to, uh, to fund infrastructure problems, but I think it's important to know where we come from and, uh, and where we think the debate ought to go. Thank you. I know we had a... I, ju I just wanted to throw one thing in that, you know, when we go back 20, 25 years and you're talking about the debate then, you take the debate forward, you know, the U.S. airline industry, uh, uh, prior to deregulation, deregulation in the industry today is significantly different. And one, one point that I think we shouldn't miss is uh, we've just gone through domestic consolidation, but we're on the cusp of international consolidation and international competition and the costs to compete internationally are, uh, are incredible. And so anything we're doing with our U.S. national airspace, we have to recognize that there are state-owned enterprises, that their governments are investing in the infrastructure in those countries that allow them to compete better internationally and better in, even in the U.S. airspace. So we can no longer just look at it that we're isolated in the world. We have to think globally and that in this uh, discourse we're having has to take that into account. It's just not enough to say as they cross the border, they're paying into our private system. You have to think that we're competing with internationally state-owned enterprises to our own detriment, and we have to think it through carefully. So. Let me go one step further than, than, uh, than Lee did on uh, foreign governments investing in infrastructure, aviation infrastructure. Foreign governments invest in something that's a lot more important than that infrastructure. They invest in the human capital of, of their aviation business. They, if you go to any aviation university in this country, good proportion of the students are there at, you know, they're being subsidized 100% by their foreign government. And we, in, to get funding for an aviation student in this country, it's, you probably go to barber college uh, easier than that. And, <laughs> and that's just not right. And so that even underscores that. I would like to take a second when we talk about national priority. Sometimes we've got to celebrate our victories. And they may not be pretty how we got there. But if you think about it, just a couple of months ago, less than two months ago, uh, because of the work of everybody in this room, um, the U.S. Congress, 100, 100 to nothing in the U.S. Senate, and what was it, 400 to 30 or something like that in the House, something like that, in about four days, uh, you know, fixed the, to keep the system running. They fixed it, and they haven't done that for anybody else or anything else because I think that is the best message that at least, you know, when, it, when push comes to shove, you know, they do recognize, we hope, and it's our job to make sure that they continue to recognize it, that, that is, it is the fundamental driver to the U.S. economy. So. Thanks. Anybody else? Any follow-up? All right. Please give the, uh, the panel a round of applause and thanks.